Welcome everyone. This is Tim Ward from Mechanical Hub Media. We are excited to have you join us tonight for getting mixed up at the OK Corral with our effervescent Bob Hot Rod Roar. We've got Max Roar and of course, other special guest, Cody Mack. At this time, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Step back, enjoy. Bob, it's all you. Well, that was quick. And thanks to Mechanical Hub for helping us put this together. And thanks to my whole team. I mean, it, it really takes a village to put one of these together to get all the logistics sorted out and stuff. So uh, Mary and Max and Cody and everybody at Cleffy that helped me with this. So yeah, so we're gonna do this thing uh, similar to we did uh, last time. We'll talk about um, mixing valves and then we're gonna have a little uh, kind of a banter argument. Cody and Max are gonna do the showdown. So um, Max is running this from his house. Mary's up in Milwaukee. Cody's actually on vacation and uh, the golf floors, so we're scattered all across the U.S. But we're gonna we're gonna pull this off. So, um, yeah, this is just the uh, typical housekeeping slides here. You know, if you do have a problem with the audio, you can um, dial in on your phone. There's a number on your invite there. So if for some reason you don't have a good connection or something tonight, sometimes it gets busy at night. You can actually just dial in, and you can still watch it on the presentation. But sometimes that works a little bit better. Tech support number that's actually for go to meeting. That's not our tech support. So don't call them with a, a problem with a mixing valve or something. And then uh, yeah, at the end there's going to be you'll get emailed a little uh, survey. And if you want the presentation, the PDF of this, we'd be glad to share it with you. Uh, within a couple of days, it'll be up on our YouTube channel. You can just um, you know search for the showdown on our YouTube channel, and you can uh, watch it again or share it with somebody else if you want uh, to do that. So housekeeping, thank you. Yeah, so there's the uh, the rest of the tech uh, the tech team, the uh, trainers. Cody and Max, and there they are in person. So thanks guys for joining me and they're gonna be in and out and they're gonna help me with the presentation. If I screw up or something, I ask them to make sure that they keep me on the straight and narrow here, partner. So I'm gonna be part of the, uh, of the presentation throughout. Sounds good. All right. All right, so we're a winner, winner, chicken dinner. So every year we submit an entry to the, um, the Ashley HR Expo uh, Innovation Award category, and we've been runner up a couple times, but this year we actually won. Unfortunately, we weren't to be able to go there in person to pick up our award, but uh, we uh, submitted our angle mix valve, which we're going to talk a little bit about as we get going here. But uh, we're proud to be the winner of that. And we're going to certainly brag about that for the uh, for the next year, I guess, until uh, hopefully next year. Uh, Las Vegas, I guess it's going to be the next HR. So hopefully we can all get together and uh, uh, meet and greet and press some flesh at that event. So put it on your calendar for um, Vegas next January. I guess it's January. And what else do we have? Yeah, so next month what we're going to do is um, what you've probably noticed by now, and you'll see more and more of uh, uh, BSP type of threads. You know, a lot of the boiler companies have European roots. In fact, a lot of the U.S. boiler companies are being bought up by European companies. So you're going to see a lot more of these BSP connections on things. So good, no good news is that the Cluffy, we have a lot of connections for that BSP thread. We can go to a lot of different types of tube and uh, press and sweat and thread it. So I thought that we'd do the next presentation just talking about all the different connections from a one-inch uh, a G thread BSP connection all the way up to two inch. So I think that's going to be interesting for you that you can kind of mix and match connections on a lot of our products and other products, really. That's a kind of a universal thread. So that's going to be uh, March 29th. Okay. Yeah, and so a little bit later on, we're going to give away one of our angle mixers since we're so proud of that valve, and we're going to just have Siri help us uh, pick that out. So stay tuned for the giveaway. And that's uh, since we're on this slide, I'll talk a little bit about the angle mixer. This is a unique valve. I don't know that there's another one in the world like this. And what we did, as you can see looking at it, is we made an angle pattern. So you can just screw that right on the top of the water heater. In fact, we can give you a, a threaded connection on the bottom of that. The, uh, the hot port and then uh, nice about that is you just go straight up you don't have to put an elbow or a T or something to make a, a change direction right off the, the bat so and it's a nice flow through a valve and you can go through a valve at an angle like that instead of making a right angle turn 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 in and out you get a little bit better flow pattern to it so we'll show you what that looks like inside and notice the connections on that that's that one inch G thread I was just talking about a little bit and what we can do with that valve is we can mix and match. If you wanted to uh, thread it onto your water heater and if you want a copper coming into the other side there and if you want to go PEX out to your building or something like that, we could put three different connections on that valve so you can mix and match and you can see there's a uh, 
a temperature gauge tailpiece on that also so you can uh, have the temperature in there if you want to dial it in and get it set uh, perfectly so pretty unique in the, that we have a lot of connections that we have a unique uh, pattern to that valve all right all right so we got a lot to cover tonight so we're going to talk about the different type of mixing valves thermostatic valves and also the uh, electronic or the uh, digital type of mixing valves uh, we're going to talk about the inside. There's a lot to know about this valve. This is kind of the uh, the workhorse of our industry. When we think about a valve and that it works on plumbing applications, works on hydronic applications, it's worked in solar applications, it can be used as a mixing valve, it can actually be used as a diverting valve. I think I got some towards the end some slides of how you can actually use a mixing valve as a, as a thermostatic valve as a diverting valve. So uh, there's some pertin uh, important things you want to know when you select this valve, how to size it properly um, so you don't get in trouble, and also servicing it and how you can use it with a pump for a hydronic application. So we're going to look at all that in the next hour or so. So here's what I did is out in the shop, I, uh, we're going to have a demo, a live demo a little bit later on. And so what I did is I mounted all of our valves and I cut them away like this so you can see inside. This is a really good training um, tool, a cutaway, because you can show somebody, you know, what's inside there, how they work, you know, how the um, the springs and the shuttles and stuff like that work. So I mounted all the cutaways above uh, a regular working valve, and then we're going to show you a flow test on the valves and how the different valves perform. So in fact, while we're looking at the slide, I brought one here. You can and you should make a cutaway yourself. So here's an example. What you can do is if you cut this valve, and I just, I don't know if you can see that very well, but what I did on this is, um, I just took my porta band and put it in my vise and it just cut the valve. And when you cut it, if you cut just a little sliver off, then all the guts will stay in it. If you cut it right in half and you're trying to show somebody, things can pop out and then you'd have to get to glue them in or silicone them in. So just take a little, you know, what, about a quarter cut off of that. And now you can make yourself a cutaway. You might hit it with a belt sander if you want. So take the guts out, cut it away. And now if you're training your own people or if you want to, you know, show up, a customer you know what's inside this valve you got a nice example of a cutaway there so uh, yeah just uh, just take duct tape on the trigger of my porta band clamp it the vise and get the women and children outside and uh, I just saw through it so let's start over on the well let's start in the center because this is the go-to valve this valve has been around for a long time I mean you'll see that under a lot of different there's probably 30 different brands of this typical you know three port thermostatic t-shape let's call it mixing valve in the center there and to be honest with you, when you take them apart, there's not a huge difference from brand to brand. What you will notice about a Cleffy, if you put it next to some of the other brands, is our body in the center is much bigger. It's about oh, almost a half inch wider than, you know, I guess I can say at Honeywell or Watts. Uh, and nice about that is you can put a bigger cartridge, you can put a bigger spring, you can put a bigger regulator in there. Everything gets bigger when you have more space in there and you've got a nice flow path. So, um, you know, it'll be heavier when you put it in your hand uh, compared to one of the competitors. Notice, gosh, it feels... A little bit heavier because obviously there's more brass that we make a, a bigger shape to it on the uh, center body and there's another example of uh, different connections so there you can see the um, uh, male thread on the left NPT thread you can see a press fitting on the bottom yeah thanks Max and then on the right that's actually a check valve tailpiece um, we have check valve tailpieces available for the sweat and for the press so if you and sometimes you uh, want to have check valves on there if you're going to research through this valve it's a good idea to have checks you can buy this valve with or without them you can add the checks in later if you have a problem where you're getting a crossing over because you've got the uh, pressure differential or something like that and um, so inside that let's talk about what's going on inside there so notice i painted that red and uh, blue color so obviously the blue for the cold water and so what happens that shuttle in the bottom on the very bottom center there's a little what we call a heat motor and it's just a copper capsule and it's got a ground up uh it actually looks like somebody took and ground up some copper on a, a bench grinder or something like that and mixed it up with some paraffin wax and that's what's inside that so as the water hits that it expands and it moves that shuttle that white part that you see in the center it moves it up and down and if you notice on the left and right there's an opening at the top of the valve and there's an opening at the bottom so as one opening is getting bigger the other one's closing so on this valve and most valves like this you can't shut off those ports completely. As one opens and the other one's closing, it's kind of like a double hung window. There's no place where you can actually get them both closed off. So that kind of has some disadvantages. Sometimes you want a valve that can, uh, what we call a scald guard or a fail safe valve, that if uh, you know the temperature gets too hot or something like that, it can shut off both ports. And we'll, you'll see that when we go through the demo here a little bit later on. So 
What you're gonna notice inside all these valves, the tank mixer on the left or a little H valve on the side, there's a lot going on inside these valves. In order to make this valve um, accurate and respond quickly and get the listings that you see on the bottom there, the 1070 or the 1017 on the, the POD stands for pointer distribution, by the way. So that valve is gonna go right on your water heater, your tankless coil, your uh, combi boiler, whatever it might be. That valve mixes the temperature before it goes out to the building. The H valve on the right hand side would go right under the sink. That's going to be your point of use, POU valve. I guess I must have edited out my little, my little label I had on that H valve. So yeah, so the center valve again, that's kind of the workhorse valve. It's been around for years and years. So what we try and do at Cluffy is try and make something unique and different. When we look at a product and say, okay, we've been doing this forever. What could we do to that valve? And the clever people over in Italy came up with that angle mixer. So if you go over to that angle mixer, a couple things you're going to see. Uh, like I say, it flows right through it. And notice that um, when we come into the valve, we're actually at a 45 degree angle. So we've got a really smooth flow. Where we don't have to make a right angle turn like you do on the T-shaped valve. So good flow going through there. This valve actually does fail safe. And you'll see when we flow test that, we'll talk a little bit more. It's also a very quick responding valve. This is an excellent valve if you've got a tankless water heater, if you've got a combi boiler that can react real quickly, if you've got a... Um, a tankless coil and an old maybe oil fired boiler something like that this is an excellent valve in fact this valve was originally developed in uh, italy as a valve specifically because they use a lot of tankless water heaters over there specifically for that so this is a really quick responding valve it's a very accurate valve and this is a valve it's hard to see or <clears throat> kind of far away but the uh, the ports in this valve are configured a little bit differently with that spool in the center that we can um, shut them both off so we can make this valve fail safe even though it's not required on that 1017 point of distribution listing to be um, you know skull guard or fail safe valve uh, we built that into that valve and that's that's unique and when we talk about domestic water recirculation that's a pretty important part of that so um, let's talk about that H valve. This is a new valve for us. I think there's only two or three other brands that we're aware of that make this H pattern. And so this would go right under a sink. So it's got three eighths um, connections on it. So you could put supply tubes, you could put flexes on it. And so obviously you just come straight from your angle stops or straight stops right into the bottom of it and go right up to your fixture out the top. So it cleans up the piping. If you were gonna do that with one of the other valves on the left there, you'd have to put a T on the cold because you gotta feed the valve and you have to continue on up to the, uh, to the sink or to whatever the, uh, the fixture is. So this just cleans up the piping. It's got a nice little wall bracket. You screw it onto the uh, wall or whatever's behind the sink there. And then you screw the valve to it. So now you've got something when you start wrenching on it and you start making your uh, connections, it stays you know, plumb and level in there. So it makes it a little bit quicker and easier to put it in there. And notice this valve, being a point of distribution valve, does have two check valves there on the bottom of it. Uh, and those checks are protected by little strainers. And if you have uh, hard water, if you've got debris in your water, just know that there's little strainers in there. If somebody says, I'm just getting a trickle out of my sink, what's going on with my, uh, my mixing valve? A good chance that those little strainers. So just take the supplies off and you can get in there and uh, you can actually get those check valves out too if you get Teflon tape or something stuck in a check valve. Uh, you can service both those checks. We also sell this with a little cap that goes on the cold water side on the top, because if you've got a, a, a faucet that's, you know, like in the airport where you reach your hand under an electronic faucet, there's no handles on it, it just comes out warm, hopefully. <laughs> After a little while, it comes out warm if you're lucky. Um, obviously, you don't need the cold port going straight through, so you can just cap that off. It's just a little, um, you know, three-eighths compression nut with a, a little plug that goes in there, caps it off. So. Um, what else about that valve? Um, <clears throat> any valve that's intended to be used as a point of use valve is limited to 120 degrees. You can't set it any higher than that. It has to be what we call tamper proof where somebody can't just reach under there like the, uh, the center or the left one there. You can just reach on that knob and turn it unless you lock it. Uh, this one requires a tool and uh, it comes with a tool that goes in an Allen thread in the end of it that you can uh, make the adjustment. It actually comes on the bracket when you get it you'll see a little kind of wing nut looking thing you break it off and that's your uh your allen wrench or you could use an allen wrench too if you lose your little key to make an adjustment on it so that's a pretty unique valve that's a you know time saver it's a space saver it just really cleans up but makes it look professional too when you stand back and you see the pipes coming in and the pipes going out instead of a a lot of commotion with uh t's and a homemade system there um what else in there yeah i think that's pretty good on that one max <clears throat> So
So every valve that you buy, whether it's a ball valve, a mixing valve, a check valve, just any valve, it'll have a CV number assigned to it. So when a manufacturer makes a valve, they flow test it and they give it a number called a CV number. And basically to keep it simple, a CV is how many gallons per minute will flow through that valve with a one pressure drop? So if I had a pressure gauge on, in this case, the cold side and the mixed outside, and I'm flowing a given amount of flow through it, I'll have a one um, PSI pressure drop. So most of these small thermostatic mixing valves are going to be around the 3, 2.8, 3, 3.1. I've seen some brands out there. So <clears throat> what you want to do with this valve is you want to know what kind of flow that you need to get through this. So let's say you've got a house and they've got... Um, or well, maybe they've got a big uh, high fill, uh, high flow tub valve or something like that that's going to flow eight gallons or nine gallons, ten gallons a minute. Um, what you can do with this little, and we can send you this little cheat sheet that Mike uh, Schreiner built, this little Excel sheet here at the bottom. So if you go over to the lower right hand box there, and what I did is I put the CV in there. I put three. That's a, again a typical three quarter one inch uh, thermostatic mixing valve. It's going to be around the three CV. And I said, okay, what if I'm going to move eight gallons a minute? So anything in the yellow, you can put a value in there. So there's a three C valve with eight gallons a minute, and then you can see what that's going to do to the pressure drop going through. And we've got it both in uh, a PSI. So if you're on a domestic water, how much pressure am I going to lose from my incoming pressure? Uh, to the outlet of the mixing valve at the uh, eight gallon minute flow and also feed ahead so if you're trying to size a circulating pump if you're using this for a mixing valve for a radiant system or something like that and you got to buy a pump well how much pump power do i need to overcome the pressure drop where you're going to get in trouble with this valve if you use this on a radiant application let's say you need 10 12 15 gallons a minute to go out to um, uh, some lower temperature zones put that number in there and you'll see the pressure drop starts to go up pretty quick on this pump and you're going to get to a point where you're going to need a big, you're going to need $26.99 or double 11, whatever high head pump is out there just to overcome the pressure drop in that valve. So just be aware that sometimes you've got to go up to a larger size valve if you're going to start jamming, you know, 8, 10, 12 gallons a minute through it. So, and we, of course, offer these all the way up to two inch on the thermostatic valve so we can handle that application. And then the other boxes here, if you know any one number, you can solve for the other, just like any math equation. So there in the center, if you could measure the pressure drop going through the valve and you could, um, you knew the valve was a three CV, look at some of our valves actually say it right on it, like our zone valves will have a CV sticker on it, might be on the box, or if you go to our tech literature, it'll tell you the CV of the valve. Well, then I know how many gallons per minute's going through it. So if I'm troubleshooting, let's say a radiant job where it's not keeping up on a demand day and the design calls for eight gallons a minute and you measure that and you say, well, I'm only getting seven gallons a minute through it, there's your problem, Vern. And the same thing if you've got a valve with an unknown CV, if you can know the flow rate and if you know the, um, the pressure drop through the valve, you can solve for the CV. So that's why you give you all three. And the above it there's the formulas if you want to do the long hand math but it's it's nice to just be able to input those uh those numbers in there and see what that valve is going to do or what kind of resistance you're going to get through that valve and this could work for any valve if you've got a check valve if you've got a you know a, a ball valve if you've got a zone valve this cv chart works for any valve it's not specific to our valves it's not specific to a mixing valve it's a good thing to have because even check valves you should be paying attention to the cv on the check valve um, not the pipe size. In fact, since we're talking about that, what happens more often than not with check valves is they're grossly oversized. If you take a one inch check valve, it's got like a CB of 11. And the problem is if you take a one inch check valve and you're only moving eight gallons a minute through it, you're not opening the gate in that check valve and they can chatter, they can sound like a, like geese eating dominoes or something like that. And that's, uh, you know, you got too big of a check valve, you should have sized that valve by the flow rate going through it, not by the pipe size connection. And you'll see that on engineered jobs, you'll see pipe coming in and you'll see a tiny little check valve and then the pipe gets bigger on the other side. Well, because they size that for the flow rate, not by the uh, pipe size. Same thing with pressure reducing valves. Any valve that has to control accurately, you really should be sizing that by the CV number, not by the, um, the connection size to the valve. So there's a little helper. Let us know if you want that. We can send that, um, that file to that Excel file. Yeah, Bob, we actually had a, a couple of people here that actually were, were looking for that in the questions box. So if you if you do want a copy of that uh, spreadsheet, definitely just type it in. Say, send, send me that spreadsheet uh, in the questions box and we can get one out to you. Yeah, because if they get the PDF of this, you won't be able to use it from that. You'll need, you need the Excel file. Correct. Right? Yep. Yeah. All right, so here, yeah, so flow rate. Now, <clears throat> 
there's another example there with a six gallon minute flow rate. And what I wanted to show is if you're using these Delta P pumps, you can see that pump, the red areas where that pump can work. Some of these pumps are, are what's called a, tr a truncated curve where they don't go, that's why the red doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So um, that's a good thing to use a pump like that. If you've got zone valves specifically that the pump can modulate around, again, just look out on the head there on that pump and make sure that you're gonna overcome, again, with a six gallon minute flow through that valve, that's a pretty easy load to cover with, a, with that pump right there. But that's where you're gonna have to pay attention. You might have to go to speed three in some cases to be able to, overcome that uh, non nine feet ahead that's going through that valve. You can see on the chart, the max is moving the cursor. So he's probably trying to keep up with my fast talk and here I'm uh, looking at the numbers and showing you the uh, the head at the bottom the, or the head on the left and the GPM on the bottom there. But yeah, use, use your pump curves in conjunction with the CV calculator that we're showing you here to make sure that you've got the, um, the right pump if you're doing um, <clears throat> hydronic applications with a mixing valve. Okay, what else do I have there? Yeah, and so that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier. We just put a graphic to that. So there's a, a manifold with what do we got? 12 connections on that or something like that. So there's a, you know, a three CV valve trying to go through all those flow, um, through all those different circuits and you're not gonna get there. You can see on the, the chart there, if I had a one gallon minute flow on all those and I've got 12 of them, um, you can see my pressure drop there. I've got um, 36 feet ahead pressure drop just going through the, uh, the mixing valve with um, a 12 GPM load on it. So what you'll find out on um, something like that, it, you know, it's gonna flow. You're gonna get flow going through there. It's just, you're gonna get to a design day when all those zones are open and you're under design condition and it's not, you're not gonna keep up. If it's grossly undersized, you might even get, not get enough flow to, um, you know, those have actuators on it. If two or three are open, you're probably fine. But when you have all those flowing, you just can't get there from here. So pay attention to that. And, comes a time when obviously you upsize the valve or maybe you go with an injection mixing or some other mixing device if you start needing those higher flow rates. Okay. Yeah, so just know that this valve, especially on domestic water applications, it's gonna take some servicing. So there's a valve on the left that I think it came back to us and said, your valve doesn't work. You know, I just bought this valve and it's, it's not regulating accurately and stuff. And so we take it apart and you can see what's happened to that valve on the left. It's just got calcium or lime scale build up on that valve. So what happens is when you heat water, the hotter you heat water, the more the minerals precipitate out. And what happens with these mixing valves is people say, well, I want to extend the hot water in my water heater. So they'll crank that water heater up to 140, 150, 160, whatever it can get, um, get up to. And um, a couple of things are going to happen when you do that. You're going to get a lot more minerals precipitating out of there because you raise the temperature and you're also going to shorten the life of that tank by cranking it up that hot because once you start building that sediment up, um, they don't last as long and you're building more sediment up because you raise the temperature of the water. So it's kind of like a, a dog chasing its tail. So on the right there is what it looks like. That's one that I ran it through. I'll show you a little kit that I came up to run a cleaner through that. So in fact, I think it is that valve on the left that I ran a cleaner through and just got it back to um, square one. We used to order a rebuild kit and a couple of things. Number one, we didn't sell a lot of them. And uh, I think people at some point just replace the whole valve and then maybe take the valve back to their shop and take it apart uh, when they have time. Just know that when you take this valve apart, you see that spring there on the right? It's under tension, especially if you've got the knob cranked all the way down. And what can happen is if you're not aware of that, you're unscrewing that, unscrewing that, and boing, and you lose part of that shuttle in there, you lose the fiber or the, there's a plastic washer that goes against the bottom of the spring and it shoots across the room. So now you're missing a part and you put it back together and it doesn't work properly because you left out a part that you didn't realize. So what we decided to do now instead of um, a rebuild kit is just, uh, you can buy a body only and it's not that much more than what the rebuild kit was. And now you've got a new body, you've got new uh, innards and you don't have to take it apart on the job site to put it back um, Put it back in so just keep a spare body on your truck i guess is the bottom line just switch it out and if you want to take the other one back and uh, clean it out and have it for a spare uh, you can do it when you're not in front of the homeowner maybe so yeah and you know there's jobs out there we know that uh, you know every six months uh, you have to descale these valves because they're just gonna what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a call that you know the water it's just right and it's too warm and it's a little cold the valve is trying to hunt and basically because of that lime scale that you see on the left valve there, it's not able to move up and down real smooth and accurately. So it, it's, it's stuck there, then all of a sudden it jumps quite a bit and then it jumps back down and that's because it doesn't have that, um, 
that smooth motion inside there. So I got to thinking about that and I got uh, one of these tankless water heater uh, cleaner kits and I just took a Y hose from the hardware store there and basically I just pump into the uh, the Y hose through both the ports of the valve and out the bottom and that's how I got the valve on the left to the condition on the on the right there by just and it only takes about 15 or 20 minutes of just running that um, that cleaner through the valve you don't have to disassemble it you don't have to take it apart you can do that right at the job site just um, you know take your bucket of cleaner in there it's got a little submersible pump in there plug it in, run it through there for a while, and then just put the valve back in. So that's another option for uh, cleaning them without having to uh, take them apart. It's really, you know, the body in there is the key to cleaning them because those O-rings need to be able to slide up and down easily and smoothly inside that body. So that's where, you know, sometimes people would buy a cartridge and replace the cartridge and say the valve still isn't working properly. Well, you got to get the line. <laughs> it's the body, not the the cartridge necessarily that's causing the problem. It's a combination of them, but a new cartridge in that valve on the left there probably isn't going to work much better than the cartridge that you just took out of that. So clean the body. And over the years, you know what, we and other manufacturers, we tried chrome plating, we tried epoxy coating, we tried resins, we tried polishing them. Just everything we could do to try and make that slippery enough that the lime scale wouldn't stick. And we haven't found anything that, uh, you know, extends the life of this. You just got to service them. We heard we had a call from a company, uh, in fact, down in uh, the neck of the woods where Cody is right now. They wanted to uh, get some cleffy valves to try. They said they're having a lot of problems with their valves. And they say, you know, we're just, we go around all week long just replacing these valves. So we were asking them a little bit about, you know, what's the hardness of your water? What kind of temperature run and stuff like that? And it was one of the, uh, the resorts down there, one of the theme parks, and they had something like 10,000 mixing valves in all their hotels and restaurants and their property. I'm thinking, I mean, that's an account we don't want. If, if they're not going to fix their water, our valve isn't going to fix their water. They're going to have the same issue. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, you can put a softer on and, and help that problem or just know that you're going to have to go back and uh, uh, service that valve from time to time. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit. This was one of the uh, tankless water heater company came to us a couple years back when the solar thermal was hot. And this is actually three valves. I don't know if you can see the one kind of hiding on the behind the one on the left there. And basically what this was for is one of the tankless water heater companies. They wanted a way that they could put these valves on. So if the solar hot water tank was hot, the water would come out of the solar tank and go right out to the house without going through the tankless water heater and firing that up. And so basically, I don't know if you can follow the flow there where it comes out. So the solar comes in. So there, the valve on the right is actually, uh, actually acting as a diverting valve. You can see we're bringing the hot in the mix port. And as long as it's hot enough, it just goes out right through the, you know, the manifold in there. I'm just keeping up where it says final mix out there and out to the, um, out to the load. Now, if the solar dropped below a certain temperature, let's say you had that valve set at 110 degrees, you don't want water much colder than that for showering, it would just go to that valve um, in the back there and would go, um, <clears throat> it would bypass the solar completely. It would just shut the solar off and let it start going through the instantaneous valve. And then the third valve was your final temperature mixing. You can actually do this with two valves, but we put the third valve there. So if the tankless lost its mind and went up to 120 or 30 degrees or something like that, uh, the third valve, valve number three there, would give you your final blended temperature. So there's actually three valves working together there to divert from one load to the other, or input to the other input, and also mix the temperature down. And actually, Cleffy in Italy makes this all in one forging. They make a forging that's got three mixing valves built into it. But um, talk about a, a deliming you know, nightmare there. Now you got three valves that you got to take care of on this assembly. But um, yeah, the solar industry started to go away and uh, that job kind of never happened as far as building these for um, that company, but you know, just a clever thing you can do with them. I've also seen people use these up on solar collectors as a diverting, uh, if the collector got too hot during the day, you put one of these on, then you put a piece of fin tube behind the, uh, the collectors and it would dirt, divert it through the fin tube and it would just shed the heat up on the roof instead of overheating your, uh, your collectors or your tank. So. Another way you can use the valve is a diverting function instead of a, a mixing function. How am I doing for time, by the way? Oh, I got to keep going here. Um, all right, so a couple of things I want you to know where I put the arrows on this. So every valve, it doesn't matter what brand it is, is going to have a number on there that tells you the temperature difference that you need between the hot water coming in and the mix going out. And you can see on ours, what do we got there? I've got the arrow pointing to it, 27. I guess I put 25 at the top, sorry about that. 
what I'm trying to say there is the hot water coming in this valve needs to be 25 degrees warmer than the mix going out. So let's say you're going to set your valve at, um, I don't know, 120 degrees. You're going to have to have your water heater set at 145 degrees because you got to have enough differential in there for that cartridge to get temperature around it to be able to move and accurately uh, adjust the mixed outlet. Now, if you fall below that, let's say somebody's got this on a, a mod con combi and they're trying to keep it in the sweet spot on the condensing mode and they've got their combi set at 120. 25 and you're trying to mix it out to 120 or 115 this valve is going to have a hard time keeping a stable temperature it's going to do the same thing i talked about earlier it's going to hunt it's going to be just right it's going to be too warm it's going to be too cold there's just not enough differential going around that little copper capsule in there to get the resolution i guess is a good word i don't know if cody or max have another way of explaining that but that's a number that a lot of people don't pay attention to both on mixing for domestic water but also on a radiant if you've got your boiler set at 130 degrees and you're trying to mix 120 to your radiant, you don't have enough resolution in that valve. You probably wouldn't notice it as much in the radiant as you would in the shower. You can feel that temperature moving around if you're in the shower and it's changing, you know, three or five degrees. The radiant, you might not notice that. So that's one number that you want to pay attention to. And it's going to be on every thermostatic mixing valve. Some are 25. I've seen some 27. Um, what we tried to do, go back on that one slide because one I want to show back up once max on the um the valve over there on the right on our angle mixer um you can see the numbers a little bit different on that one. we've got 27 degrees there so pay attention to that and just know that you've got to keep that valve um the hot coming in hot enough i guess is the uh, what i'm trying to say yeah one of the things we run into pretty regularly bob is uh guys will they'll call up and say you know i've got the valve set to 120 or the you know just past number four on the dial and and they'll say well you know i've got 120 coming out of my tank how come i, I can't get 120 out of my mixing valve and it's it's the fact that you know we mentioned it before you know a lot of these point of view distribution mixing valves cannot completely close off the cold side uh, in order to just flow through the hot side and so it's going to mix down a little bit and you're not going to get your full temperature not going to get there yeah exactly so unfortunately you got to crank the temperature up i know you know what's happened in the hot water tank or industry over the years is you know years ago people were getting scalded so the manufacturers put limiters on them so you couldn't set a tank over 120 degrees well now the whole legionella thing hits and people want their tanks at 140 so now they got to put a mixing valve on if you want to maintain uh, 140 degrees to kill any bacteria in there you certainly want to put a mixing valve on there you don't want to send 140 or 50 degree out to the um, thing so we'll get our temperature back now but yeah when those tanks were set at 120 degrees it was hard to get them hot enough for the the mixing valves to behave properly so this is our 5213 series this is a point of use valve this goes out again at the fixture notice on the um, right hand side there are check valves on this because the point of use valve needs to have check valves couple other things you see the arrow the blue arrow on the left there <clears throat> this valve is a little bit lower uh, temperature requirement between the hot and the mixed outlet it's only 18 degrees on this valve so this one is uh you know you could have a little bit uh lower hot temperature on this valve and this valve is going to behave and notice too that this valve at the bottom has a 0.5 gpm uh, minimum flow rate the same thing happens if you don't have enough flow going through a mixing valve it won't mix properly uh, the same thing, the valve will start hunting because that uh, copper capsule in the center on the picture there to the right, it needs to have water going all the way around. It has to have enough flow going through these two side ports to be able to warm that uh, paraffin wax mixture in there for the valve to be able to regulate. So if you were trying to just get a trickle, say a 0.35 flow through that, you don't have enough water going by that copper thing to heat it up to be able to move and the valve starts to lose its resolution again. So this is a pretty low number. A 0.5. The only lower one that you find out there is like our H valve, which goes, you know, a, a single sink. That'll be a 0.35, and there it is right there. You can see the um, 0.35 minimum flow rate on this because it is an individual uh, fixture type of um, application. And I think 0.35 is where a lot of the uh, lab faucets have the restrictors in them, like uh, commercial lab faucets, for example, will be uh, restricted to 0.35. So. That's why we give you this one. And notice too that the maximum flow rate on this, 2.3 GPM, again, this is intended to be a single fixture. You wouldn't put this at the end of the line and try and feed you know, a, a bank of uh, sinks like in a, a restroom at an airport or something like that, where you'll sometimes see a mixture at the end feeding a whole row of them. The 5213 would be better for that because you could feed you know, four or five, six sinks out of that half inch valve. This is just intended to be um, 
uh, right under the sink of point of use valve. Three eighths compression makes it real simple and easy. Uh, what else on that? Yeah, I think that's the um, pretty much what I want to talk about there. This here has been the biggest hit, I think, of all the valves that uh, I've been involved with at Cloppy. This has been our biggest win to date. This is a electronic mixing valve. So what's going on in the industry right now is people are saying, well, is there another way that we could make a valve that we're not dependent on those thermostatic cartridges and all the guts and the springs and the cartridge and the O-rings and all that? So what we came out with, it's basically a motorized three-way ball valve. So a couple things about that. If you can see in the center, look at the flow path through that. You could drive a truck through that, a matchbox, but it'd be a truck. Um, it's a full port ball valve. So now we've got a huge CV on this valve. In fact, there's our three quarter um, Legio mix valve. It's a 9.7. The three quarter that we showed you earlier was a three CV. So three times the flow rate through this valve. Um, it's gonna be a, a valve that if you need a high flow condition, um, this is the type of valve you want. So the other thing that happens is once you put electronics on a valve, once you give it a brain, so to speak, put a microprocessor on it, now we can do a lot of different things with it. We can exercise this valve. Once a day, this valve is gonna turn, it's gonna move that ball in there. So if it's, so what happens is that ball is just typically moving a little bit of a stroke in there to keep the temperature mixed where you want it. What'll happen is the lime scale can start building. You've tried to shut a ball valve off that's been in there for years and you get it part way through and it won't shut and you break the stem or you break the handle off because you got lime scale build up on that. So this ball is gonna rotate and wipe kind of like a windshield wiper. It's gonna wipe itself clean. So once a day, it's gonna exercise and try and keep itself clean so you don't get it where it's gonna you know, have that sticking condition. I can put it in a high temperature mode for Legionella protection, like at you know midnight tonight, I'll tell that valve, go to 140 degrees, let the whole building circulate at 140. If you're gonna do that, obviously you'll wanna have protection at the sink. So if somebody gets up in the middle of the night when it's in 140 degree mode for an hour, you certainly don't want them uh, getting 140 degrees. So that's why these, you're gonna see a lot more of these valves out there because <clears throat> people are cranking up their water heaters, certainly the buildings that were starting to open that have been sitting uh, empty for about a year now, you know, as they start opening nodes, they're going to have to run those temperatures up to make sure they kill any bacteria that might have grown in that, uh, in the piping, the biofilm. So this valve here, get used to uh, putting these in because this is the only way you're going to be able to protect um, your customer, the, the end user, is have a valve right at the sink. So it's a good sale because it's, um, <laughs> you go in a hotel or a, you know, the office building or something like that, there could be dozens or hundreds of these in a building. So um, that's a simple way to do that. So Legio mix there. Um, let's see, what are my slides? All right, so if you're gonna have a thermostatic mixing valve on a domestic water recirculation system, here's what could happen with this. <clears throat> if this valve is on there, and you can see the way this is piped with the recirc, if you look the way this recirculation is happening here, is you're bringing your recirculation water back to the cold port of the valve. And so what'll happen to this valve, if nobody's using water, say during the night or something like that, and the warm water is coming back to the cold port of the valve, the valve starts to lose its mind. And what's gonna happen, it's gonna open up that hot and the water coming out of that mixing valve is gonna be whatever temperature's in that tank because it's open that port. The right way to do that is we need to send a little bit of that water back to the tank with a balancing valve, like you see on the bottom of that, and some of the water goes into the cold port of the valve. And really we wanna balance that so we have just enough water going through the recirculation loop to overcome the temperature drop in that loop. Anything after that, I wanna put back into the tank so it pushes hot back out to my hot port of the valve and I get my resolution back. So if you've got a job where they say, you know, the first thing in the morning we open our faucet and the water's scalding hot, after a minute or two, it gets fine. Once you flush all the water out of the piping, that's what's happening is that valve is creeped because it wasn't piped in there with the balancing valves that need to be adjusted. So um, if you see a thermostatic valve with a recirculation pump, it really needs to have those two balancing valves that you see in there. And we've got this in our tech uh, literature. We did a, a couple of hydronics issues where we put this in there on domestic hot water, the proper way to, um, to pipe a, a thermostatic mixing valve with a recirculation uh, pump on it. And, and Bob, too, we actually did a webinar, the Coffee with Coffee webinar that we did a number of years ago with, with uh, Julius Blanco yep. uh, about how to pipe this in with research creep and everything else. And and uh, it's just amazing how many calls that we get about this, you know, where, yeah, they get a really hot shot of water in the morning and then all of a sudden it works great the rest of the day. It's because, yeah. of, because of research creep for sure. And I never knew that until I started to work for Coffee and we started getting that complaint. People say, your mixing valves aren't working. I said, something 
something's not right here. That can't be all these vowels are bad or they're misapplied or something like that. And I remember reading that article at Jupiter Splunker in 1994. And for whatever reason, I kept that article all these years. And I brought it out when this was coming, uh, coming up a lot of clap. And I said, this guy wrote about this way back then and what happened with the mixing valve. So we called him up out of the blue one day. I said, Julius, would you do a webinar on this? You know, recirculation creep or droop. It can actually droop too if you don't have the flow right. So, and he did. He came on and did a webinar for him. He uh, did a great job. And I think it's a, if you go to our YouTube, I think it's been viewed like 80,000 times or something, which makes me think a lot of people are having that problem and never realize that there's a mechanical, a, a piping fix for that. So, um yeah if you get a chance to uh, watch that video because it's a uh, good information on proper way to he explains a little bit more in detail what the balancing valves do how to set them up and uh and other things i don't want to burn in the uh too much time you know we're looking pretty good i think yeah let's do a couple more now that being said if our angle mix valve, remember a little bit earlier, I told you our angle mix valve can shut off its port. So in this picture here, you don't need to pipe in the bypass with the balancing valves if you use our angle mix. So there's another reason to use the angle mix, number one, the uh, straight through piping, but it is a, a valve that can shut off and you won't have the temperature creep with this valve. So you just simplified your life. You took two balancing out, you took uh, the piping out, you didn't have to figure out how to adjust the balancing valves to get it uh, uh, set up properly so the angle mixer should be your go-to valve you put a temperature gauge on the outlet of that so you know that you've got it dialed in if the inspector wants to see that the valve has been set up properly you've got the gauge there he can just go and open a sink somewhere and uh, uh, see that that valve has been set up uh, to whatever the code requires typically 120 sometimes daycare and elderly homes will have 110 degree um, requirement on the setting a little bit lower temperature well, and you're saving yourself a lot of liability too, Bob. I mean, think about that. I mean, you get a you, Julius Blanco does uh, does a lot of uh, he's an expert witness in a lot of like legal cases about scalding and things like that. Correct? Am I right on that one, Bob? Yeah, he's a forensic engineer. I guess is what you call him. He goes around when there is a scalding issue or a problem with a building. He gets called in with, okay, what happened? You know, what? How do we fix it? <laughs> Who's at fault here? Who could have sued or whatever? But that's why we're going to pay. Side here to show you the simple. Okay. Yeah, just the reduced amount of fittings there to two less valves without the balancing valves as well. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to put balancing valves in, but you got to know how to adjust them. And I'll just tell you quickly, you put your hand right at the mixing valve and you put your hand on the return coming back and the return coming back should be about five degrees cooler than hot going out. That tells you you got just enough flow going through your building to overcome the temperature. Really what I want to happen with my research is that very furthest fixture at the top right on there gets water within a couple of degrees or whatever it left the water here at let's say 120, maybe 116, 115 gets out to the further fixture. I don't care what happens to the temperature coming back at that point. As long as my customer got hot water at his fixture, you know, it could droop, you know, 10 degrees. If it was uninsulated copper, it might droop that much coming back. But um, that's my intention is to make sure that the very most remote fixture is getting hot enough water and um, that's all the recirculation pump is doing is overcoming the temperature drop it's not pumping the water out there it's not um forcing the water up to the high point of the building it's just keeping that loop like um kind of like a hydronic loop really it's just keeping it flowing and keeping that temperature up and that would be a great uh fit for a use for a thermal camera like we talked about in the the webinar last month too that if you put some of that you know electrical tape on the outlet and on the return there, you could just kind of look at that with the thermal camera and, and dial it that way too. Yeah, you could just set it up with your camera until you got your temperature differential that you wanted. Good point. I think, are we getting ready for a giveaway or something here, Max? What's next? We are. So let me, uh, I'm going to do a random number. Um, and we're actually, we've got two winners today. So we're going to give away two different angle mix valves. Let's see if, uh, there we go. Get the animation to bounce in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a random number uh, from my iPhone. So I'm going to have Siri pick a random number between 1 and 190. Okay. So the first one is a big number. That's 180. There so is. what we're going to do, can you see that? Yep. 180 is the first number. And then I'm going to do a second one. And then while we play the video, Mary's going to sort through the the attendees and figure out who that is, and then we'll announce it after the video. So for the second one, 
Siri, pick a random number between one and 190. Okay, small number, 38. Okay. All right, so now we're going to go to this next slide and I'm gonna play the videos that you did out in the shop. So hold on just a second. Hopefully this fires up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But cross your fingers, everybody. If not, we'll talk through it. <clears throat> I like to see how things work, so I gotta go out there and hook them up. I, I can read about it and understand it, but I'm from the show me state, so <laughs> pick up all these valves and uh, put them through their five, two, one, three, point of use mixing valve. Let's turn this on. I got it set to about 120 degrees, so you can see it's flowing pretty good right here. Watch what happens to this valve when we lose the hot or the cold. So let's start with the cold. See if we turn the cold off here. Within a couple seconds, that valve goes down to a no flow condition. Turn the cold back on. <clears throat> now, if we lose the hot, same thing happens. Goes down to trickle and then completely stops. So this is what's considered a scald guard type of valve. It'd be used under a sink like that for your final protection mechanism. So here we have the sink mixer, another point of use valve. I'm gonna turn both the hot and cold on on this thing. I got this thing set up to about 120 degrees. That's the maximum setting on this. So what we wanna see here is what happens if we lose the cold water to this valve, what's gonna to happen to that flow. So we turn the cold water off and you can see within seconds that flow will shut off completely. Same thing with the hot. If we lose the hot to this valve for some reason, within a couple seconds it shuts off. So another uh, point of use mixing valve, skull protection on this valve here, four port valve, little cutaway here that you can see the check valves, the strainers, those might need service from time to time. Uh, you can see the flow passage through that valve on that little cutaway. All right, here's the tank mixer, the 520, unique angle pattern to it. So you go straight through off the top of the water heater. Let's get this thing flowing up about, uh, get this up about four gallon a minute here, flow rate. And you can see we've got both of them open. Now what happens to this valve? This is a point of distribution valve, but look what happens if we lose the cold on this valve. Flow drops off. This valve isn't required to do that, but this is handy if you're using it on domestic water recirculation. You won't get any temperature creep. But if we shut the, um, lose the hot on this valve, same thing, just goes down to a trickle flow. So that's pretty unique about this valve. Not many of the point of distribution valves have that function where they can shut off like that with, uh, you can see the hot water off, we just get a little trickle cold through there. 521 Mixcal, this is a point of distribution valve also. Let me turn the hot and the cold on in this valve here. I'm gonna get a pretty good flow rate going through this here. The flow coming out of that. Let's see what happens to this valve if we would lose the cold supply to this valve doesn't shut off the hot port. This valve is intended to be a scald protection valve. Let's turn the cold back on. See what happens if we lose the hot supply to this valve. Same thing. Doesn't shut off. Cold water comes out, but it doesn't uh, shut off completely like the, the other two valves that we showed. Just so let's get this thing running up again. Both of them running. I got just under three here, four, five, yeah, 5.32 gallons per minute coming through this valve with just the, some washing machine hoses feeding it. So we got the Legio Mix 6000. This is also a point of distribution valve. I've got it flowing oh, just under three gallons a minute here, going up a little bit, three and a half gallons a minute. So what I want to show you here, start coming out of it there. Let's turn the... Um, cold water off first and see what happens. So what's gonna happen is the valve's gonna screw all the way to the cold position, and it's gonna, with the cold turned off, it's just gonna stop. So here, it takes about 30 seconds. Electric valve takes a little bit of time to screw over to that position here. If you wanna wait a second, we'll give that a try. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the cold on, turn the hot off, and see what happens to the valve. And it's gonna do a similar thing. It's gonna screw to the hot position with the hot turned off, and it'll just shut off. Yeah, this it reacts a little bit slower than the thermostatic valve because the motor has to actually wind from one extreme to the other. So there it is with the cold water shut off, hot water turned on, shuts right off. Well, let's turn the cold on, get it flowing back up there to three, four gallons a minute, a little four gallons a minute. Now let's turn off the hot supply to the valve and see what happens. So what's happening now is the motor is going to wind all the way over to the hot position. The hot's turned off, and here in about oh, 20 seconds, 
you'll see the same same things that happen it's going to shut off completely so it does protect it's not a 1070 valve not listed to that standard but it does fail to a safe position which is a nice benefit of it too to have a point of distribution valve that can serve both functions really give it a second here just about there you can see the flow starting to slow down a little bit and there we have it cold's on hot's off nothing's coming through the valve Okay, so we are back from the, the video. Mary, do you have a couple winners to announce? You know what? I have some good news for two gentlemen in the audience. Now, Darren, I'm going to try really hard not to butcher your name, but Dara, Darren Guaguen is our first winner. And thank you, Travis Ball, for making it easy for me to say your, your full name. <laughs> but you are our two winners, and congratulations, guys. We'll be in touch, and you get to choose an angle mix with the fittings of your choice. Right. And you can mix and mac match the connections, whatever you want. So, yeah. And I think uh, now we are going to bring Cody Mack back in because he has this crazy idea that electronic mixing valves are better where I'm a little bit more traditional and I think that the thermostatic mixing valves are definitely the way to go for commercial jobs. Now be careful, I am on vacation and it is National Margarita Day, according to everybody <laughs> that told me. Uh, and I do have a bucket of margarita back there. So things might get a little belligerent here, but we'll we'll try to keep it classy, guys. So, and you look like that Jimmy Buffett song. What's that song where he says those? I know, I know. I, yeah. I don't know, margar something about Margaritaville or something. <laughs> Lost shaker of salt. I don't remember. It's, it's all a mess. So first of all, I'll, first of all, I'll say that look at the picture on the right there. No wires. You just got a plumber. He's wrapping up that job in one day. No, no uh, sensors. Nothing. Low tech. You're gonna turn that knob and you're good to go. Commissioned out the door. Max, are you afraid of wires? Oh my gosh, uh, come on now, you guys. This is just ridiculous. Okay, any any plumber that's worth his salt can deal with 24 volts. Now, I will say that there are some areas that say anything above 16 volts that you gotta get an electrician in there. But in those cases, we've got a great product like our Legio Mix that's on a station. It's all pre-racked, pre-piped, pre-wired, everything. All you gotta do is hang it on the wall. I don't, I don't think this is, now just remember guys, we are talking about electronic versus thermostatic in commercial applications. And so, so with that in mind, keep that in mind, you know, we, we want to talk about that. So if you are looking at Legio Mix, definitely think about that racked assembly. Everything's pre-wired. You don't even have to, you just hang it on the wall, do your piping, plug know. it we in, might, you're done. We might need a judge's ruling. Is he cheating ah. by having the, the pre-assembled rack with the electronic mixing valve there? I don't know. I mean, Bob okay. knows it's margarita day too. He's all right. So, <laughs> all right. My second point here <laughs> is that you can lock that cap and just set it no more than whatever temperature you want. You can verify with the gauge coming out of it because we all know that some maintenance guy is going to go down there and one day is going to say, oh, what does this thing do? And turn it all the way up. And with an electronic control, what if somebody just starts go to, you know, starts pushing buttons with that control, then you're in trouble. You have to go back. You just get done telling me these guys are afraid of wires and you're telling me now they're going to press buttons? Get out of this here with that. This is a different guy. Nonsense. This is the maintenance oh, guy. Oh, yeah, it's a different get, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another five degrees to the shower. No, you, you, get, you get the electronic mixing valve in there. You know what's fantastic about it? It can connect up to your building management systems. You can adjust everything through the BMS. You can do all that stuff. It gives you all the information. It does data logging. It does all this cool stuff. Can your can your thermostatic do that, Max? Wait, so I'm adding a guy and you just casually <laughs> mentioned a building building management system that's uh, yeah, that oh, yeah. be involved well there's none of that we're just twisting a knob on this valve and we're good to go ah, ah. no you get your commercial buildings they're all asking for electronic these days they're all pushing these thermostatics to the wayside <laughs> well what about like the angle mix goes up to one inch now so that's nice simple piping has that close off so you don't need to do the research balancing coming let's, back i mean that's pretty let's, good let's hear let's let's hear a vote from the guys that are doing commercial jobs how many one inch mixing valves are you putting in on a commercial job i mean come on now hey, the well, legion mixer carry, no the legion mixer it for your radiant inch, job inch connections oh get out of here right there. just in case you're doing those huge radiant and then also a very small domestic system in the same afternoon. You can just uh -huh. have one part on the truck, so you're good to go. 
All right, well, yeah. we've got tail pieces, all the tail pieces that you could want in and out of that mixing valve. I will agree with you on that one. Both of them have the unions on them, so you can connect up whatever you want. That is a great thing. I mean, PAX Press, you know, um, you know, whatever you're looking for, NPT, we've got them all. That's pretty good. All right, well, I think that I've got one more dagger for you. So Kalefi has the AHR winner 2021 for a thermostatic mixing valve, an electronic mixing valve from Kalefi, this one on the left here, the Legio Mix, was only a finalist in 2020. So one whole step down from the entire uh, the entire industry. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Now here's the thing. I don't think that's a great point to make because I, you know, come on with that. But, the panel but, of, uh, of our peers or somebody that makes that decision though. Speaking of peers, how many peers have had to rebuild thermostatic mixing valves? Let's hear that in the questions box here, guys. I mean, rebuilding mixing valves, it's like a full-time job. Like Bob said, in some of those uh, resort communities, kind of like the one that I'm in with the fantastic beachfront decor. Um, you know, with that in mind, you've got your Legio mix. It's got that three-way ball that'll swipe that thing clean once a day. You don't even have to screw around with it. And like Bob said, you can run a, a tractor there that out and put the new body in and you're good to go yeah you don't even have to deal with it with legio mix though all right well i think we're gonna have to let the audience decide here so let me launch the poll and we'll let uh the group decide who won that argument then you can put, one of each put them in parallel <laughs> one of each and... yeah. Right. yeah starting to roll in here all right we'll see what the Thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. We've got a great audience tonight. It's nice that everybody took the time to, to come and uh, listen to us talk. All right, we've got 71% voted. So if you're still out there uh, going over the notes that you took, <laughs> we've got a couple more seconds and then we'll close it out. Looks like Max might be, uh, I don't know. There's. The... All right, let's see. All right. Wow. All right. Well, in almost the same margin, uh, I lost uh, two thirds to one third again. So I guess people are, are moving in the, the way of the electronic uh, mixing valve. So I guess I'll just have to hold my head in shame again. Uh, Your streak stays alive, Max. Don't drink all of that bucket of margarita that you've got down there. On, oh, no, I got to pace myself. I'm a lightweight. You're gonna have to overnight some of that to me for my uh, sorrows in uh, Salt Lake City. So, Will all right, do. we've got uh, the slide. Here Cody won, so I'm on a, a two. I'm an O and two participant in showdown so far. So why don't we open it up to the uh, rest of the group? If you've got any other questions that we didn't answer, it looks like there are a good amount of questions that came in here, so we can address some of these on the call and then uh, get back to some of you by email if they're case specific or something like that. So a lot of these look like they're that spreadsheet almost, or a lot of people looking for that spreadsheet. Um, what else? I did have one question there? about whether or not I travel with a headset and microphone. And the answer to that is yes. Of Why would I go anywhere uh, without a headset and a microphone is beyond me. But uh, um, with that in mind, yeah, I'm trying to look through here. Uh, do you see any there, Max? That would be good for the. Um, a lot I guess. Of questions in here. Yeah, I don't. One of them I don't quite understand. Sizing-wise, we can go up to two-inch thermostatic uh, with all the different connections, and then we can even get into flanged with the the electronic mixing valves up to three. So. Well, I was going to say too, the thing to remember with a lot of your electronics, especially a three-way ball valve, just because you have like a one-inch connection on that ball valve, that three-way ball valve, like a mixing valve, doesn't mean it's meant for one-inch pipe. You, hopefully everybody that's on this webinar is smart enough to realize that you size a valve based on pressure drop and flow rate, not necessarily based on pipe size. And, and if there's wholesalers in here too, I've seen a few of you guys in here, uh, if a guy comes in and says, I want a two-inch mixing valve, valve uh, that's when i usually kind of cringe a little bit you know you get our legio mix with a ball that valve assembly in there i mean you can flow so much through there that usually you're stepping down a pipe size if not two in some cases uh to connect up to your legio mix because uh that's all you need you know you can get such a great flow rate through those valves without uh without much pressure drop and that's a fantastic thing and you well, might yeah. win the bid by having the right you know valve and a lower yeah. price if you're going from you know inch and a half to one inch or whatever the the case may be that you're going lower and it's going to be the the right uh the right thing to do anyway so 
And that three quarter legion mix for people doing the big uh, trophy homes, that would probably cover a pretty good size home because of the CV of that valve. So like Cody said, you don't want to oversize a valve. It starts to lose its uh, authority, so to speak. You don't want to take a ball valve and have it shut 90% and have the flow going across that edge of that ball in there. So you, you, you know, we'll help you if you don't know uh, what size you need, uh, call us up and we'll help you with the pressure drops and we can tell you um, the valve because we have had a couple where people grossly oversized them and the valves don't like to uh, operate under that condition with a low flow through an oversized valve, any valve really, it's a zone valve, mixing valve, a balancing valve, they should be sized for the flow rate, the CV number. All right, what, uh, yeah, I think we got, uh, we'll get back to the questions if we didn't answer them tonight. I think some of these we answered and went through it. Um, anybody have anything? Is Mark out there? So next uh, next month, we're gonna do um, uh, In Cahoots with Kalefi Connection. So uh, as my dad was mentioning at the beginning, and then the showdown, we're still uh, trying to figure out who the participants are gonna be, but I think we might do something fun like press versus sweat versus pecs and kind of duke it out with that, which I think, uh, will be an entertaining one. So that's what we're up to next. Um, thanks for joining us. Anybody else have any uh, closing statements? Hey, I got a question. I got a question. This is Mark. Um, by the way, Max, I voted for you. I think Cody oh, threw, you. He threw you under the bus um, you know, unfairly, I think, on the, on the electrical wire situation. So uh, <laughs> you, you got my vote. <laughs> I was even wearing the right shirt. I had the shop talk shirt on and everything. So I, thought I, would I wasn't home to get mine in the mail. That doesn't count for anything. Come on now. <laughs> here, here's a really good question. Uh, I, I lost it, but I think I'll get the gist of it here. So basically, when you have a uh, hot water recirculation application and you have a standard, a traditional thermostatic mixing valve, master mixing valve, and, you know, when you're coming back around to the tank, you know, we, we show how to use a couple of valves basically to, to basically balance your heat loss. If you, if you are, instead of coming in to the cold water, if you instead ran down to your, your drain port and you return back there, would you still require balancing valves in that case? To the drain port of the, like the bottom of the tank like that? Yeah. As a, as opposed to the cold inlet, like at the dip tube? Yep. Yeah, yeah. it's... You could do that. I mean, a dip tube is taking that cold water to the bottom of the tank, so you could go <laughs> put a tee there where that drain cock is and put it there. I mean, water's going to get to the bottom, whether it's going down through the dip tube where you put it right in there, but it won't change the need to balance. You're still, okay. I mean, putting water in there to push hot water off the top, basically. Yeah, okay. So you can, you can bring it in either way, but you still would have the requirement of the risk of temperature drift by not having those balancing valves when you're using a more traditional thermostatic mixing valve, not the legio mix and not the angle mix. Is that correct? Yeah. And some commercial tanks will have a mid port for the reserve too. That they bring it in so they're not stirring up the whole tank. They just take the middle to the top of it. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, I'm trying to look through and see if there's anything else or anything else catch your eye there, Max or Mark or anybody. Uh, there's a well, question. Gonna... Go ahead, Cody. Uh, I was going to say, you know, uh, you, you mentioned minimum flow rates, Bob, before, and I think it's really important to, to stress on that, especially when you get into commercial applications with um, with thermostatic mixing valves. You know, like we have thermostatic mixing valves up to two inch connection sizes, and that's great if you've got a higher flow rate. Uh, but the minimum flow rate is going to go up, you know, as your as your mixing valve gets bigger, so does your minimum flow rate. And and that's a big issue that we run into on a lot of tech calls um, that guys are getting unstable outlet temperatures and things like that. And, you know, you look at some of these larger mixing valves and they've got that minimum flow rate that might be four, five, six or even eight gallons per minute. And and if you're not meeting that minimum flow with from your demand or through your research, that's piped appropriately, hopefully, um, you're going to have a lot of issues. And that's where, you know, high-low thermostatic mixing valves are going to come into play. Uh, that's where, you know, you might be able to get away with uh, like a Legio mix that does have a higher flow rate capability, but has a lower minimum flow rate capability uh, to, to get stable outlet temperatures. Uh, we get it a lot where guys are replacing, I shouldn't say a lot, but it's 
more than I would like, where guys put in a second mixing valve thinking the first one's bad, and then the second one does the same thing, and then, then they call, and they're like, well, wait a second, what's happening? And it's it's not a mixing valve issue. It's not even a Calefi issue. It's it's an oversizing issue uh, that, uh, that needs to be addressed for sure. So be really careful anytime you're looking at larger mixing valves to make sure you're meeting those minimum flows. And there's some jobs out there, Cody. We've had this happen at old buildings back east. We had one a couple weeks ago from New Jersey. There wasn't a recirculation in the building at all. And they got a two-inch mixing valve, and they say, you know, our temperatures just aren't regulating. I said, well, you got to put a high-low in there. So you've got the three-quarter valve for those low flow conditions. I don't know. You know, we've got one with a pressure-reducing valve between the high and the low stage. So it'll handle, you know, just a hand sink running as opposed to, you know, 80 gallons when everything's open on it. So, you know, we can solve that uh, on a building that doesn't have any recirculation by putting that high-low. So, yeah, we got you covered whatever the application, whether it's the electronic, the high-low, the pre-built stations. Um, we think we're, um, we can help you with whatever you need out there. And, yeah, let us know what your your project is and we can help find the right valve. If you call in with the, you know, sure. the, the flow rate that you're looking for, we can see if you're on the fence between one or the other or whatever. So. And the biggest problem we have when people say we want to size a mixing valve is they don't know how many gallons per minute their building's using. We had this uh, big building down in Oklahoma here a couple of months ago now, I guess. They say, oh, yeah, we've had trouble with the brand mixing valve that we have. We want to go to, and we said, well, how many gallons per minute? They had no idea. I said, well, go and rent or borrow or whatever you can do, an ultrasonic uh, flow meter and put it on the feed to that water heater and just, you know, data log it for a week or something like that and see what at a peak demand of the hospital, I don't know what that would be, showers or people washing their hands or whatever. I said, you know, we're gonna, just because you have a three inch pipe coming in that building doesn't necessarily mean that you need a three inch valve. So that's, uh, you know, if they don't do that and they grossly oversize that valve, it's not gonna give you the results that you're looking for. So you can rent those ultrasonic meters. They clamp on like a hand cup on your pipe and it'll it'll give you a reading that you can, uh, you know, watch it through a, a course of a week or something with a high and low peak and then we can get it accurate for you. So. Here's another question in here. Um, Bob, you showed a photograph on your wall of one of the mixing valves that had, uh, I think it was a press connection that had the check valve built inside of the connection. Yeah. The question is, maybe you can explain what the purpose of the check valves. Why use them? Why not use them? Yeah, let's see. I don't know if we're going to find that one. Yeah, I mean, you can have a pressure differential from the hot and the cold, and where we have this happen from time to time, I know Cody gets this call, is the, if you've got like a tankless coil on a, on a boiler and it starts to get limed up, you can have a higher pressure when that valve opens up on the cold than you do on the hot because you got all that calcium and lime in your, in your tankless coil, so now you got a pressure imbalance. You know, you got you might have cold water pressure at 60 pounds, and by the time it goes through the tankless coil that's lined up, you got a you know five or 10 pound pressure drop. So then the valve um, can cross over. So the check valves are net. If you're going to put a recirculation pump on it, you want to make sure the water doesn't go backwards through the valve, so they can be used for that uh, application. What else, Cody? There's a few other uh, things that come up that the check valves will. Yeah, and um, I was going to say too, like if you if you look at the ASSC 1017 standard, it, it does say that you have to recommend check valves for portable applications. I would never recommend check valves in a mixing valve like this for uh, space heating applications. Um, but you look at like the point of use mixing valves, for example, uh, those require, absolutely require for the ASSC 1070 standard to have check valves in them. And the biggest reason why is because if you don't have check valves in there and you're not flowing through that fixture for whatever reason, it's just off, you have created a cross connection from hot to cold, which can lead to huge issues in especially commercial buildings uh, where you can have cross connections. You're going to be diluting down your hot water and things like that uh, that can cause a lot of grief for tenants uh, looking for hot water and waiting and waiting and waiting. So, Yeah, that's you think about that valve. you got your hot and cold connected as a cross connection. If something fails in there and people say, gosh, my cold water is lukewarm or something like that. Well, yep. it used to be the mowing cartridge or somebody put a wise hose on a mop sink somewhere and they've got the hot and cold open. they got a cross connection, but it could be, in fact, from your valve. Now you got to go turn your stops off and, and hunt that down, figure out which valve is crossing over. So that's a good point, Cody, with the with the checks on the certainly you can see there in that H valve where that could uh, that could happen. For sure. Another question came in on that H valve by the, by the way, Bob. Uh, the question is, um, how does the sink mixer, the H valve, uh, compare to other point of use mixing valves on the market? I think there's two of them, right? Two other ones. Uh, what are the benefits of having a? Um, what's the benefit of Calepis? Anything you want to point out? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's two other that we know of, uh, other brands, the H valve, this configuration that you see there on the right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, our checks you can get to easily. That, in fact, that same job I was out in Oklahoma, they had a, another brand there. They said, we're just having a lot of time, hard time with the strainers and the check valves failing there, and you can't get into servicing. But I don't know if you can see the way the cutaway is there, but on the right, there's a nut that you can take off that you can get in there and pull that check out. There's a little strainer protects that check. So, this is a serviceable valve. It, um, it comes with the, um, uh, the connection nuts for it, and also you can get the, the plug for the port. If you, uh, um, I think it's another kit that you have to buy. I think it comes with five plugs, so you could do five valves with the kit on it and stuff like that. The bracket, I don't think any of the others that I know of have a, a wall mount bracket. So then they're either hanging off the supply tubes, or it's under there crooked because you got those uh, flexible supply tubes, and there's nothing really mounting the valve that you can uh, keep it nice and straight and keep it out of trouble. And a lot of times on commercial buildings, they've got to insulate the supply, the angle stop, and the supply tube. So if you've got it mounted solid, you can bring your insulation uh, jacketing right up to the bottom of that H valve and out the top. It just makes it easier to work on and do all that stuff if it's not moving around on you. So between the uh, you know the check valves, the serviceability on it, the um, the ability to just mount your bracket first, put it up there, and screw it to it. Um, easy to adjust. The, the um, an H valve like that, that might be the only thing that 95% of the general public ever see of a plumbing system. <laughs> so it's nice that it's installed straight with the bracket that comes with it. It doesn't look like it's blown in the wind. That that might be the only thing if someone looks under the sink that they ever see of the entire hot water system. And if it's at a 45 degree angle and it says the name of your company on it, it doesn't give you know the quality impression. So I think that that's a, a nice thing to add on. And yeah, the adjustment key is right in that. Um, so it comes with everyone. Yeah. And there's one more, one more question in here too about the lead geomix specifically, guys. Um, and I've actually had this question before. They asked uh, if the lead geomix can be used to maintain an output temperature for large radiant zones, and and that is 100% correct. I mean, it, it's basically a set point mixing valve. And, and you could use the lead geomix controls. Um, I've even had guys where they, they look at that valve and actuator and use it with a separately sourced uh, like outdoor reset type control before too. I mean, it's a great valve, really high flow rates, really low pressure drops. So like Bob said before, if you've got those radiant jobs that you think you think a one inch mixing valve is going to do the trick when it's in all reality 36 feet ahead, like he talked about before, uh, you get one of those lead geomix valves with the actuator, you can use it as a kit. You can use your separately sourced control. You can do whatever you need to do, and it's a, a great valve for that. I don't know if you've had any questions about that, Bob, about using it in Radiant or- Well, I played it. around. I had a Tecmar control out my shop, and it's just a floating 24 volt. So Tecmar's got a couple controls that'll drive that. There's a few other brands out there that still use that floating 24 volt uh, output. I think Honeywell's got some valves. So yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just an actuator on there. Just send it the right signal, and it'll do that that mixing for you. Yeah, I think it'd be a great radiant valve, especially on those high flow conditions. You got a um, you know a nice quick responding valve with a high flow rate. Cool. All right. Great. Well, cheers everybody to National Margarita Day. So I'm gonna <laughs> celebrate your victory and uh, try to get any additional sunburn while you're down there. And yeah, uh, I'll I'll work on that. No guarantees. Well, <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thanks, the hub, too. Thanks. Good night.